Professor Lakhotia with us. Professor S.C. Lakhotia, <clears throat> currently a BHU Distinguished Professor and SCRB Distinguished Fellow at the Department of Zoology, Banaras Hindu University, is engaged for nearly 55 years in, in studying diverse aspects of gene expression using the Drosophila model system. Nearly all of his research work has been carried out in India. His recent contributions to Ayurvedic biology using the FLY model have provided a new stimulus to unbiased, proactive research using contemporary understanding of biological and material sciences for revival of Ayurveda and its integration with the contemporary healthcare system. He has written many articles and organized discussion meetings on issues related to quality higher education, research publications, and assessment in the country. Professor Lakhotia, leading by personal example, is a strong votary of promoting publication of high quality research journals in India. A large number of undergraduate, postgraduate, and doctoral students trained by him, irrespective of gender, caste, or creed, are successfully pursuing their chosen careers. In recognition of his contributions in research and education, he has received many awards and recognitions, including fellowships of all the three science academies in India, the INSA Young Scientist Medal, the SS Bhatnagar Prize, the UGC Career Award, <laughs> UGC JC Bose Medal, INSA Aryabhata Medal, the International Association for the Study of Tra Traditional Asian Medicine or ISTAM, Zandu International Oration for Excellence in Research Contributions for Ayurvedic and Natural Products. He is on the editorial board of journals like J Biosciences, Cell Stress and Chaperones, RNA Biology, Annals of Neurosciences, to name a few. He served 2014 to 2018 as Editor-in-Chief of the Proceedings of Indian National Science Academy. We are really lucky and highly honored to have this opportunity to learn from him about ethics. Uh, There's a short interview session so that we can know you better and what your views are. Uh, sir, uh, my first question would be if you would be, uh, if you would share your journey as a scientist with our viewers. Okay, that's a Difficult question because it's a long journey. But then as a scientist, and let, let me say it, it has been a very remarkable journey. A uh, lot of struggles, a lot of pleasures. And ultimately in the end of it, more pleasure than struggle. Because pleasure comes only when you struggle. If, if you, because these, these are very, very relative terms. And, and, and this has been, a, a pleasure has been to have been involved, to have been, uh, get answers to questions that have, that have been burning in heart. The, as, as I said, passion is very important. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I moved from one area to the other, it's not because that area was becoming fashionable, because, but that area could provide me an answer to some question that I had. In the process, we started with uh, lots of uh, techniques. One important point that I've always tried to do is try to learn new techniques, state-of-the-art things that are current, currently coming, and keep on evolving. What we learned in our master's classes and bachelor's classes were a set of techniques. And then that prepared in certain ways, but then as we moved along, newer and newer methods kept on coming in. And the idea has always been to get acquainted with these techniques, learn one, oneself, learn from others. And very often, having been working in university system with uh, limited resources, yeah. we had to be innovative we had to fabricate many sophisticated equipments ourselves, but in a simple way. And that's where I say common sense, it becomes important. Like I remember when we, uh, with one of my students, Tapas Mukhopadhyay, we discovered that the HSR omega gene is non-coding at that time, it's called 93D puff. Some, a question that I've been trying to answer for almost 10 years, couldn't do it because we didn't have money to buy a gel electrophoresis, uh, vertical gel electrophoresis system and a gel dryer and so on and so forth. Tapas built it with his own hand. Wow. The <laughs> yes. And then we discover this gene doesn't make a protein, 1982, when selfish DNA was at its peak. Just in 1980, 
Crick and others have suggested that a lot of DNA doesn't make protein and it's selfish and useless. And we discovered a protein that a gene that we thought is, well, is interesting is a non coding one. Non, I, I can claim that was one of the first non coding genes that were discovered in the soft line, as, as explained. But then I'm happy that some journal published it, Chromosoma published this paper. Okay. But it was a real struggle against the wall because anything that's nonsense, uh, selfish, can't be funded. My contemporary uh, Competitors in Heidelberg and MIT didn't get funding for working on this gene. Fortunately for me in India, I could get some funding. And interestingly, my Bhatnagar Prize happens on this gene. <laughs> that's, that's something very interesting. And I yeah. think, it, and, and I consider very lucky to have been working in India that I could get funding, could go along. And now, of course, we know non coding RNA have become so important. Hmm. Everything uh, there. Many, many more papers on non-coding RNA than on protein coding genes now. And, and this is, again, I feel very happy that way back in 1996, I had predicted that non-coding RNA will be very important. I wrote a review, and as my habit has been, I, I put my uh, ideas often in Indian journals. This is one thing that I decided way back in 1972, when I started my independent career, that any research paper that comes out of my lab, my work, 50% of it will be in journals outside India, 50% in India, irrespective of, uh, it was kind of alternate cycle. Mm -hmm. If one paper has gone to a journal outside India, next paper must go to a journal in India. The only re re requirement being, journal must have good reviewing practice, good publication mm -hmm. practice. And I'm, I'm very happy to say now uh, I've actually done this uh, kind of impact factor assessment and citation assessment. Impact factor wise, my total impact factor may be very, very low. Average impact factor may be less than two even for all, all my papers put together. But citation wise, my papers in Indian journals and papers in uh, journals outside India are nearly equal citation. And therefore I can say with uh, confidence that publishing in Indian journals had not at any disadvantage to me. Mm -hmm. And right. something that I can uh, also tell young people to feel happy about it, that despite my low impact factor sort of, mm -hmm. I've been included in top 2% balance in the world. I'm included in the top 2% nurses. All, all research get members in terms of my impact. So I, I think what is important is the same point, not where published, what is published. That's and right. as long as, and, and this has been one of my motto that, that has driven me all through in research. The passion continues. And I still, uh, even today, I spend whole my day in the lab. I have my research projects, I have my research students, and I want to take more students. As long as fortunately my university has allowed me a life, lifelong association. I can work in BHU, have my lab as long as I want. And, and that has been a very satisfying experience. The scientific journey, of course, my research papers will tell how I moved from uh, pure chromosome work to uh, both biotechnology, molecular work, genomics work, and uh, uh, what, what all comes in together. Drosophila remains my common organism. That has been the fascinating thing. I I'll just share one, one more issue which made me move to Drosophila. As a young child, I wanted to be a scientist and wanted to be a scientist in relation to uh, medical field, health issues. Mm -hmm. I'll not get into detail why that happened, but that happened because of some upbringing that I had experiences. But then, when, uh, so in my master's in Caltech University, Zoology, where I joined, I couldn't become a doctor because my school result was very poor in Calcutta. There was no hope of getting into medicine. I, Neither I had money to get the capitation fee nor had the merit to get into medical college. So I joined bachelor's uh, BSc course in Calcutta and uh, got, got into master's and I took parasitoids as my special because of my parasites in relation to the human health. Mm -hmm. And there I worked on a protozoan organism where I thought I saw extra nuclear DNA. Okay. Unusual. Mm -hmm. I have a, my first paper is on this uh, parasite. Based on this, I went to then young uh, teacher, Dr. S. Mukherjee, who had joined zoology department as a remarkable genetic, cytogeneticist. Mm -hmm. I, joined, I went to him 
that I want to do research on this sex or nuclear DNA that I found out. Mm -hmm. that, that was my question that I wanted to follow for my PhD. And he candidly and should, as a, as a good teacher should do it, he said he, he is not competent to guide me on that protozoan parasite. He can guide me on Drosophila, guide me in the basics of genetics, how genes function, and then I can go back to this protozoan parasite for my later research. Fortunately, unfortunately, I've never been able to revisit that parasite. It still remains a big question. But I got hooked onto Drosophila, one of the most wonderful genetic organisms, and I enjoy working with it. That's, that's how the journey has gone on. Amazing. Thanks for sharing. Uh, sir, uh, what motivated you to build a long career in science? Well, long career, you see, it's a, I, I, didn't, I don't think that when I started as my lab in 1971, I got appointed as a faculty in Bardhuan University when I was less than 26 years old. I was lucky that mm -hmm. I could finish my PhD um, just for two and a half years time and could uh, get, uh, get a job. But at that time, I didn't think that I would have a long job, but, but I knew that teaching and research is my life. I, I cannot, I was very clear in 71, even before I had a job in university, that I do not want to join a research institution. There were possibilities of my joining a research institution, but I wanted to teach. That was something very clear in my mind that I want to teach and therefore, although I had no job offer, but I did decline offers from institutions that are sorry, I can't. But having taken this, I enjoyed every moment of it. And therefore it has, the journey has gone. Even today, I love teaching, I love research, and therefore the, the journey keeps on getting longer as long as I live, I'll, I'll be with it. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Sir, uh, you are a reviewer for many renowned, uh, renowned uh, journals and editor of books. Uh, can you give us some key takeaway messages uh, how we can improve our manuscripts? Well, that's a improving manuscript. I think the first thing we must understand and where the, we often suffer is good language. Mm. Language is very critical, not flowery literary language, but you know, one should be able to put one's ideas in a good grammatically correct, logically following language. And that requires that before you write a manuscript, you must have the whole story in your mind like a video that this is what I want to communicate, this is what I want to communicate, and it should follow logically. Absolutely. And of course, a standard manuscript has a standard format. Each journal say that you want introduction, middle methods, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Few things that we need to take care of is each journal gives description of the style that it follows. Right. Whether middle methods come before uh, results guidelines. or at the end. And so yes. the guidelines should be carefully read. Mm -hmm. How are references to be cited? Mm. how many references, what the style of citation in text and in it. This is, you know, when, when it comes to reviewing or for an editor, if you find that the authors have carelessly done anything, you are already on the negative side. <laughs> Maybe the paper is good, but then, you know, the, you have earned a negative point. So this is something that must be understood. But more important is, what are we wanting to communicate to the reader? Right. What is the carry home message? If you are also not clear, the reader cannot be clear, the reviewer cannot be clear. Mm -hmm. So these are things. And, and of course, the, the other side becomes quality of the data, quality of the, and the way it has been generated. Are there mm -hmm. unethical practices? Are there something that immediately becomes apparent? You see, sometimes what happens is that this is our, our experience. Mm -hmm. I read a manuscript, introduction, first para is very nicely written. Second para, there is something, sudden mutation has happened. Language is very peculiar, and you can immediately make out plagiarism. That copy and paste. Now, this, this, this has to be avoided. Yes. And today, of course, most journals have a kind of software that mm -hmm. will check for plagiarism. Mm -hmm. And if you have plagiarism, and, and there again, it's very standard that we do not worry about extensive similar language in material method section or in reference sections. But in the introduction and discussion and results part, of there's a large similarity. And that large similarity is taken anything about 10% or 20%. Then the editor may decide not to even get, get it reviewed. So very often what's happening is many journals see many more manuscripts 
than they can handle. Mm, right. So unfortunately, the choice of the editor is to reject, not to accept, not to consider for acceptance. Yes. That, that is what that and that's unfortunate. Because many papers, good papers get rejected just because in the first glance edit thought okay, it's meaningless. Yes. The other unfortunate point that is happening is in many good journals, so-called high impact factor journals, editor cannot handle every journal. There are lots of associate editors who are mm -hmm. young people, mm -hmm. not that they are competent, not competent, but they don't have enough experience yet. And some of them may not even know every field. Right. So they, they say, okay, this is not my area then, and that's been assigned to me. I don't like it and I reject it. <laughs> this, 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 this happened. Okay. In no way that a, a solution can be found out. Author can fight back. Sometimes it serves, but very often editor will simply say, sorry, we have said no and no, gate is closed. But that, that, that is the unfortunate part, but that does happen. The more important is, again, the abstract itself is very critical. How mm. do you write the abstract? Right. Because that's the first thing that exactly. an editor or reviewer will read. Mm. Editor can't read the whole manuscript. Editor will read maybe abstract, and maybe if time is there, some bit of introduction and some bit of discussion. Mm. Rest is left uh, to a cursory glance. So abstract must be very, very clear. It should state very clearly background. It shouldn't go long background. Mm. It shouldn't go long description of results, nor a discussion of result, but you know, succinctly, not uh, in a very, uh, such a language that, uh, that author himself or herself cannot read later on that, what, what it meant. Mm -hmm. So it should be done. And if that is done and the question is good, the journal selection has to be again, because one of the reasons why we select, a, uh, we reject the manuscript is it's outside the scope of the journal. So mm -hmm. journal, there are many journals which are broad areas. Mm -hmm. There are many journals which are narrow areas. Mm -hmm. I, can, I must not submit a very broad area uh, manuscript to a journal which is not in that area. So, so one must look at the scope of the journal, identify the manuscript, and see whether it is there or not. The other thing, that's my personal view. Okay. I would not be worrying about high impact factor publication. That's my personal view. And therefore, I'm not worried about building a big story. You know, where, where you want to include 10 kinds of experiments and data to read, uh, you know, so-called molecular data, so-called more uh, updated techniques and so on. To mm -hmm. me, that's okay. As long as a discovery as a result makes a sense, makes some advancement, makes a story, no story can be ever complete. Uh, there will always questions raised at the end of your, how well ex extensive story you do. And therefore, if questions are defined, that these are the questions that are coming up, that manuscript has a better chance in my view of being accepted or being considered for revision and so on. But one point that I will say is, a rejection letter from an editor will infuriate us. Yes, we get angry that the editor doesn't understand and peer reviewer doesn't understand. That's a logical way of doing it. But I would fight back in a decent way. I know some journal, some papers we have taken three years to publish. We decided we publish in this journal only because <laughs> that to appear to be most optimal. And of course, fighting. I can take it kind of ego. Why, why should they reject it? Because I, I could make out that the reviewers are not understanding the journal. Mm. Three, four, five revisions. And in, the <laughs> in the process, the manuscript improved because we did more experiment, we did interpret, mm. but ultimately we got it published. We had to convince even a, a reviewer wrote, why are the authors howling? That's what the word used. <laughs> howling. <laughs> yes, because I, we, I, I did write strongly back that, it, that the reviewer doesn't understand what we are saying. Mm -hmm. mm. And, but, but then that's it. It was accepted. At one, in one case, editor even said it, paper, but we recommend that you dilute this statement. I said, mm. sorry, I don't dilute it. I did accept it, what you want to say, because we are responsible for what we are saying. Not right, you. right. The other experience that I remember and I want to share as a young student, when I was a PhD student, my supervisor allowed me to write a single author paper. Okay. And I was still working. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, uh, what, what I put in my uh, ethical thing, that if a supervisor can decide that okay, the student has done everything, had planned and written and done everything, why should supervisor come in picture? 
I submitted the manuscript to general genetical research published from Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Hard copy those days will go by uh, uh, postal surveys and come back. Mm -hmm. Several months later, I receive a thick packet. You get worried. Thick packet means the manuscript is rejected because those days uh, we submit three copies, two copies come back if it will not accept it. Okay, okay. So mm -hmm. we're disappointed. Anyway, open the envelope to see what it is. Mm -hmm. And then the surprising thing was, it did writes back that the reviewer has read it in your paper. Oh, wow. <laughs> it means read typing. Remember, those days it was not that you have software, word copy, word file, and you uh, make corrections and so on. Mm -hmm. You can manually retype the entire manuscript. Mm -hmm. the reviewer had done that. And the, the, the region that some of my terminology that I used, context, syntax was not appropriate. Okay. The reviewer liked the word. And therefore took that pain. Yeah. And, uh, and the only thing editor asked me was, if we think that we can agree with this version, they will publish it. Now, mm -hmm. this is, I think this is something that a reviewer has to do. Mm -hmm. Reviewer and editor cannot be just post office. They must. So true. Their, unfortunately, today, most reviewers, editors, because of commercial interest, have become post office. They'll just get something from a reviewer, pass it to the editor. Author uh, learns the comment uh, from the reviewers and how to improve. No, no, that, that is one part. That yes. the reviewer's part helps us. But you see, sometimes the reviewer may make an issue with the author do not agree. Oh, right. And they, then the editor has to take a decision. I can mm -hmm. share one historical uh, event of uh, two great geneticists. Uh, one was Richard Goldschmidt in the 1950s and uh, his student, Kurt Stern, who became a great human geneticist and development geneticist and later on. And this is what Kurtzson writes in one of his lectures. That uh, this is way back in 1929 when he wrote a paper and in the and he was doing his PhD. Okay. And his supervisor was, was the editor of the journal. Mm -hmm. He submits a manuscript to the, uh, to the editor criticizing supervisor's work. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is something that we, we need to appreciate. Edit, as editor, he, he returns back next to the manuscript, I mean, the response mm -hmm. that you read my paper, didn't understand them, and cursed them. I read your results. I understood them. I reject your views. Your manuscript will appear in this issue. Okay. <laughs> the, the point is, I mean, that this is, this is an important that editors and reviewers must understand. Mm -hmm. I did not agree with the, with the author's uh, views. Because these are authors with not editors' views. Mm -hmm. But as long as they are appropriate, as long as they have been carried out well, logically mm -hmm. explained, and, and this is what I've tried when, when sometimes I have, a, a, as a review, you get into argument with an editor. I, I said, okay, this manuscript can be published. Editor said, no, no, this is uh, against the current ideas and this will look wrong. I said, look, who, who knows the current ideas? Are... And ultimately, it's the, it's the author's views not editors or reviewers use. That's true. And, and I think we, we need to follow this. Mm -hmm. And the author should be aware of these possibilities as well. Wow, that was great. Uh, sir, um, when you recruit a research fellow, uh, what qualities do you look for other than academic qualities? Well, academic qualities are required, but I don't look for great marks only. I look for First thing that I want to look for is, can the students speak, express coherently? So uh, I kind of interview some students that have uh, done PhD with me long back. Mm -hmm. I, I took more than a year to finally accept them. Okay. I rejected them. Sorry, I, I'm not happy. Student says, I, shall I come back three months later? All right, come back. And this went back and forth and that. So only when I'm convinced that the student has a genuine interest in research, mm -hmm. has questions in mind, and had the perseverance to pursue this. Mm -hmm. Not that everybody has been equally great. They have been among my students. Some have done much better than others. But then the general idea is that they must be able to answer question. And mm -hmm. one, one important point that I tell my prospective students is, I'm not going to tell them, do this, do this, do this. I want my students to develop 
their own program and I learn along with them. Sometimes we have taken completely new area because student was interested mm -hmm. and student felt confident that yes, I can take up this and I've learned with that, with the student, that new area. And, and this has sometimes created some problem, but sometimes very often it has been a good experience later on that my knowledge base increased itself and mm -hmm. we could contribute in a better way. So basically what I look for in the student to take up is, of course, they should have fellowship. That's an important part because mm -hmm. not being supported and uh, being supported is, a, is an important issue. But more important is their own willingness to be adventurous. Right. Willingness to have perseverance because PhD can be very frustrating experience. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of my students have not taken less than five, six years. And so it can be frustrating, we can understand. But an important point that we try to give in our group is that our, our own teacher-student relationship is very different. They're all members of family. Right. We can fight, we can argue, we can love each other, we can uh, abuse each other, but that's all part of family. And ultimately, students uh, do not feel so depressed and uh, deprived of their other pleasures in life. That was great. Um, uh, at which point in our academic or research life uh, should we be introduced to ethics, do you think? Ethics, I think we should be introduced right from childhood. It's, it's something that has to come as part of being human being. But yes, formal ethics, each discipline has its own ethics. Uh, that has to come along with at each level, depending on what level we are like. You see, unfortunately, what's happening today is Right in school, we are teaching students to practice plagiarism. We give them assignments. And schools also, they say, write what is written in the book or what is written. If they write on their own, it's not correct. This is unfortunate. This needs to be stopped. I know with my own uh, grandchildren now, mm -hmm. when they write something, and uh, they, they, if, if they write something original, they are, they are a little worried. Their teacher may not like it because it's, you have written something different. And that's where we need to inculcate that sense of uh, eth ethical behavior there. But then for research ethics, when they are in, uh, let's say undergraduate classes, right. they should know what research is, what, mm -hmm. what it involves, and what are the good practices in research. Mm -hmm. the, the assignment as a classroom test that we do assignment I actually stopped doing assignments because what I realized was in classroom when I give assignment to students, what I get back is pure plagiarism. Hmm. And paste from net or from some figure taken here and there. And, and this is something that, that we need to tell them because they go with the student go with the impression that okay, because it's available on net, it's their property. And that's what we, we need to teach them. You see, most of the research students do not realize in thesis and papers and so on. You see figure adapted from so and so. Mm. It's it's a very common practice, but that's unethical. Mm. Unless you have taken permission from the author, from the publisher, that you want to reproduce this figure, but they think okay, it's freely available in the internet. So what's the copy? Then copying and pasting it's very easy. You see today. Now these are things that we need to train them, tell them, right from beginning, and 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 I think for research ethics. Undergraduate classes is something good, but sure for PhD students, I'm glad that the coursework has been introduced in ethics. Right. I hope it is ethically taught. <laughs> that's, that's important. Sir, uh, we're coming to the final question of the interview session. Uh, what would your words of advice be to the students and scholars who are new to the field of research? Well, the advice is, you see, it's like, uh, a young person thrown out in water would. <laughs> but as basic human beings, we can swim. As long mm -hmm. as we don't get worried and uh, kill ourselves by going down. Mm -hmm. We can make trial and we can swim. Like you see, a newborn child can swim very easily without mm -hmm. any problem. Mm -hmm. Because that's the inherent uh, biological system we have. So same way, research, asking questions, seeking answer is built in our system. All that it needs is, first, you need to identify a guide who, with whom you're 
wavelengths match. That's important. Mm -hmm. With whom your questions match. See, it, like I went to a wrong end in some ways when I, when I did for PSG because uh, the, the person was not trained in uh, protozoan and so on. But I went to a right guide because I had a question which that guide could answer. Mm -hmm. So this has to be decided that right. whether the guide can supervise you in an area that you want to work on, mm -hmm. and whether your wavelengths match. And but but that's one part. The more important part on the person's personal aspect of the research it needs perseverance, patience, continuous reading and learning. See, that, that is something I must emphasize because in today's generation, wider reading has become very rare. Even uh, classroom teaching, nobody reads textbooks now, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Textbooks are very rarely read in classroom or rarely taught in classroom. We take up some paper and discuss and we say, we have taught this topic. If I want to teach gene regulation, I take some paper in epigenetics and uh, discuss it and Epi, uh, gene regulation talk. Now, this is not the right thing. I think there's a problem in the way we are teaching. So when, when a new student comes to my lab, I say, read books first. Take one year time to read the subject, define your question. But then a, a research student, everywhere this may not happen. They, they may want it, they may be required to get into research right away. But it's in the interest of the student himself or herself to prepare one song. We can always mm -hmm. blame the system, but ultimately we are the loser. The person is loser. And therefore one has to work on one's own, agree that the systems have problems, but then what we can to do to mitigate those problems is important. And that's a wider reading, understanding the subject, understanding the question, understanding the technique. A typical thing that's happening now is most equipments are very sophisticated, automatic. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to do it. Like uh, I, I take the example of confocal microscope. Everybody wants to use confocal microscope. You give your thing to a technician and technician gives you some images. I don't think that's going, to, going in a good way. The person who is wanting to use must understand principle. And then only you can understand uh, the limitations of the study, where you can improve your results and troubleshooting. If something goes wrong, if I don't know the technique, the principle of the technique, I could not troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. So that also must be learned. And of course, there can be many, many more things, but these are some <laughs> basic things that I think should happen. Great advice. Thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm.